Hi everyone, can you hear me? Good. So first of all, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. I'm uh, Andy. I'm responsible for the strategies business in uh, Europe, Middle East, and Africa. And before we talk about 3D printing and um, about editing, manufacturing, and anything, I just wanted to share an anecdote because I started in uh, back then it was Object. Object merged with Strategis in 2013, and I joined Object in 2009. And I still remember Rob, where, where are you? Rob is coming down the stairs. Uh, I had my onboarding training in Object in 2009 together with Rob, uh, and, and that's where that's where I started. And I just wanted to say that I'm proud of you guys uh, that you have built uh, such an amazing uh, momentum in the UK but also an amazing company and you're a great team. So a uh, big thank you from Ian, and I hope that you all feel very well served by the SYS team and also by the colleagues of Stratasys that we have in the UK. So let's, let's look into, on the one hand, what is new in Stratasys. Um, some of you uh, probably know Stratasys and how Stratasys was set up in the past, but I want to make sure that you also understand what is new and where are we evolving, but also where is the industry evolving. Additive manufacturing is, is still considered an industry and at Formnex uh, two weeks ago I was asked by journalists what's new, what's exciting and I almost tend to say, you know, welcome to manufacturing, it's boring. There is no hype news that you can leverage for what's the next big thing and so forth. So it's an industry that is actually maturing and, and that's a good thing but it's still a problem that we have something called a 3D printing industry. Because what we are pushing is that we just consider additive manufacturing as an alternative to traditional manufacturing methods, such as injection molding or CNC milling. And, and that's a journey. So what I will present to you is uh, how we are set up, where is our focus, and how do we enable also the team of SYS and the UK in order to serve, serve you better on that journey. And it is indeed uh, a journey. So I spoke about Stratasys, and I don't want to want to talk too much about, about Stratasys itself, but I think it's important for you to understand that we uh, have a culture of learning from our customers, and you will also see it throughout the, pres the presentation. Um, you are smarter than us, and you give us the direction uh, because you decide where it fits and where it makes sense. So if we were to cook our own meal and, and tell you just adopt it, it wouldn't work. So we are working with uh, uh, the, the key brands globally, but we are also working with uh, all small and medium enterprises in order to learn from and uh, adapt for our portfolio. And we realized, and I spoke about object starters as the merger, we realized that with our um, core technologies, Polyjet and FDM, we are not able to serve all of the potential use cases out there. So what Stratasys has done over the course over the past two to three years is expand the technology offering. And you see it here on the... Do ah, you see it? Yes. You see it here. We now have three additional technologies. Stereolithography, which seems to be a bit odd because stereolithography is not a new technology. It's been one of the first uh, in 3D printing but it still has a very good reason of being for all aerodynamic testing, wind tunnel testing, for a lot of applications, it's the perfect technology. But we also added P3 and SAF, where now we are able to provide solutions in order to produce higher volumes. And that serves basically the fact that um, we are witnessing right now an inflection point within the manufacturing industry, where 3D printing has been uh, Firstly, used for prototyping, how do I get uh, fast as possibly from a cut file to a part in my hand? That's how 3D printing started. And now we are transitioning into manufacturing. There's more and more use cases where additive manufacturing is being used in order to produce parts. If we now look at manufacturing use cases, we can split it into tooling jigs and fixtures and into end use parts. And, and that's where we see a, a huge adoption. If you think about uh, tooling jigs and fixtures, those are the applications that are increasing efficiency on the production floor. It could be um, um, aids for workers, but it could also be assembly tools. It could be grippers. It could be all sorts of tools that are making um, the production process and the workflow more efficient. Outsourcing tools is often taking a lot of time. It's very expensive. But printing those tools in-house is allowing a huge benefit for the users. But we also see adoption when it comes to production of end-use parts. And you see that various industries 
are leveraging additive manufacturing to produce parts. And it obviously started with those industries where the lot sizes are quite small. So if it was a high level of customization or if it was uh, in medical patient, patient specific uh, solutions where the lot size of the human body is actually one because we're all unique, that's where it first fit. But now with the increasing volume that we can enable, we see more and more adaption in real end use parts use cases. And that's a trend that we see, for example, in automotive, uh, but also across very, various other industries. If you think about manufacturing and the high volumes that are needed, on the one hand, the requirement to produce certain volumes is shifting downwards a bit because there is a higher level of customization, a higher degree of on-site production where needed, when needed, in in, instead of inventory keeping. So the volumes are getting lower. And then the capabilities of additive manufacturing, on the other hand, allow more and more volumes. So there is more and more overlap between manufacturing requirements and additive manufacturing capabilities, which are opening all of those new use cases and applications that we can enjoy. And automotive is only one example where there is identified parts uh, that are in use. So a lot of our car maker companies uh, and customers are using additive manufacturing in order to really produce parts and not only for the prototypes. So that's a proof point we see in the industry. But what does it take in order to accelerate that journey? And it's really about um, the full offering. And in the past, you know, there was a 3D printer. Customers have been smarter than us in terms of uh, how to use them. So um, it, it does only address a very specific portion within this workflow. But if you think about what's required, on the one hand, certainly the machines, but also the materials, the software, the post-processing, the, the customer care, so uh, that it really becomes something which is natural. It's not uh, a lot of work, it's not super labor intensive to produce, produce additively. I'm not saying that we are there today, but that's the journey that we are focusing on as, as premises. So let's look into these elements one by one on the hardware side. On the left side, you see how it all started. That's uh, Scott Crump time when he developed a 3D printer, a classical American dream in his garage. Uh, that's what it looked like. And it was basically following the purpose to get from cut, design, in the fastest possible way to a 3D printed part in your hand. And then we started to categorize our offering in a more application-driven way. So is it an application for prototyping? Is it an application for tooling? or is it an application for an end-use part? And this is so super important because we need to be very use-case oriented. And we're thinking in use-case clusters. And you see on the right side, medical could be a use-case, patient-specific uh, um, parts or models in order to do surgery planning. It doesn't really matter what the printer looks like, uh, what the capabilities are, and what the material properties, uh, the material uh, chemicals are. It's more important that the use case is being served. So we are following uh, the requirements of the specific industry, we are enabling the volume that is required and also the certifications. And this is being enabled now by the wide range of offering that we have. So we do not need to squeeze a certain technology into a use case, although we know it's not the perfect fit. We can now leverage all of our offering and say, no, for this, head, for this high volume application, maybe Polyjet or FDM are not the right solution. So let's look into P3 and let's look into SAP. But if you have um, a requirement for, for accurate, repeatable, large parts, then FDM becomes an alternative again. And still, in prototyping with Polyjet, it's unique in terms of its capabilities for the haptics and the optics and the visual, uh, the visual prototyping stages. And we are truly serving um, applications across the full product development lifecycle. And I think this is what, what's unique about the Stratus' offering. We do not only play in certain areas of the product uh, life cycle. We play in the early stages where you have requirements for visual and functional prototyping. We play when it comes to efficiency on the production floor with tooling chips and fixtures. And we play when it comes to end-use production uh, for several industries and certain parts. And this is a, a unique position that we have. So the challenge is always to enable that and to put that into simple messages. I'm sure all of you in this room uh, if it's uh, 150 people, there is 120 different requirements. So we really need to understand what is your exact need and how can we tailor our solution offering. And it's not only the printer, it's also the uh, material ecosystem. How can we tailor our solution offering to your specific needs? 
And that's maybe some big news on the material front. If you think about material business and Stratasys, um, a lot of people think uh, Stratasys is a closed company, a razor blade model, and uh, not very open. So as a company, strategically, we decided to open up. What does that mean? We now have three tiers of material uh, streams. One is the Stratasys preferred material. If we give the commitment that it works, that it's accurate, and that we certify the material against industry standards, then it is closed, yes, because we cannot allow any room for error by experimentation or anything else. But we do understand that, it, that there is a requirement to accelerate innovation. In the past, we maybe brought one material in 18 months, and now we bring 20 in within half a year. And that's due to the second layer, which is the struggles is validated. So we are partnering with companies that are developing, and it's the big names in the, in the world, the Henkels, the BASFs, and so forth. We are partnering with those companies to accelerate innovation of materials on our platforms. And, and this is helping us in order to bring more and more materials to market, and those materials are actually the ones that are unlocking use case and application. It's not so much the printer. But we also realize that there needs to be an, an open, a stage of experimenting. If there is a desire to use whatever material on the Fortis 450 today, you can do it, but it's, it's your thing, right? We're not committed to anything. It can go, it can go well, it can go wrong, uh, but we also want to offer you the first two steps where we uh, have the preferred material, but also the validated, where we are saying this is going to work. And I think this is, is a significant change in our offering, and it's not, not easy to explain. So what is the value of this open? What is the value of locking the material for specific use cases? But uh, that's a journey that we will take together with you and enable you to do more things than before. Complementing this with software, and we, uh, we all know that software is uh, an integral part of any workflow when it comes to energy manufacturing. So how, how we envision this to be is that we have a platform with GraphCut, but you can allow um, the capability to integrate, integrate the platform into the production floor, and allow the connectivity via APIs and MT Connect in order to read data, see data, but also if you think of an iPhone, you have your application. So we want to make sure that different software value streams can be plugged into GraphCut and you can access them via GraphCut. And this is making this platform unique, so you have sort of a one-stop shop where you serve your printers, you improve the, the file design and so forth. Software is super important and also here we are partnering because we know that there is brilliant companies out there uh, that, are, that are well appreciated by our customers and we need to make sure that there is a, a level of connectivity between our platform and uh, the solutions that our customers are using. Then last but not least, we come to the customer success and uh, the services. So that's why we as an organization, we are proud to be working not only with great customers, but also with great partners like SYS. Because we want to have this proximity to our customers via our partner network. And they are all well enabled, well trained, and they have a service infrastructure to serve you as fast as possible. So that's, that's our commitment to you, that we will always try to be as proximate as possible to you and your needs. Last but not least, it's all about the use cases, right? What, uh, the, there would be no reason in order to have a portfolio with software, with printers, with materials, if we would not, would not enable game-changing use cases for our customers. And I just want to give you a couple of examples how we transform industries. One of them is obviously um, aerospace, so there is um, different developments that we have been doing with the likes of Airbus, Boeing, uh, but also Lockheed Martin where we look at the specific industry standards and requirements and we take the effort to certify our solutions against those industry standards. You see it with our Wilton 1985, uh, which is now on several um, programs of Airbus. The A350 was the first one, but now they expanded it. So you see more than 1,000 3D printed parts on such an airplane. And uh, five years ago, our CEO, David Rice, I think it was five or six or seven years ago, he said if there's ever going to be 3D printed parts on an airplane, I'm never going to fly again. But now he's still flying, he's comfortable because we did certify. And we are meeting those requirements when it comes to plane with cloud bars. The same for the pack based on 808, that's uh, what we validated and certified together with Boeing. 
or our fact based on table C03, which we worked on with Lockheed Martin. And that's only a couple of examples, and we are eager to learn from you which other requirements are out there. Where do we need to either certify the material that we have or develop a material that is opening a significant use case that you can benefit from? And we are a cook that is eating the own meal, I would say. So if you, if you think about the, the production of this nice machine, the H350, we are producing components of the H350 with the H350. So we basically, when you look at the scale of our production of those units, and we, we sell more and more, we still leverage additive manufacturing as one of the technologies we are using in-house in order to produce parts for our machines. So I think that's also, we need to walk the talk, obviously. We need to have the confidence that it works, and, and that's what we're doing with H315. And then there is markets like healthcare, which I mentioned before. And we have been playing for a long time in medical equipment testing or prototyping for medical uh, equipment. But we now have a very high focus on patient-specific solutions. So the patient journey is uh, something that we are now addressing. And if you think of a, a, a surgery, there were surgeries of uh, separating conjoint twins, which usually takes about 90 hours. And by printing the CT data and having a model where you can plan the surgery, the surgery time was cut down to 20 hours. So there was less risk of infection, and it was a successful surgery. The surgeons knew exactly what to do. And that's just another unique example of how additive manufacturing or 3D printing can serve specific use cases. So in a nutshell, um, I hope that uh, there is additional ideas for those of you who are already using uh, Stratasys additive manufacturing equipment, but also some motivation to further explore with the colleagues of Stratasys and SYS today what is possible, what can be done. And we are all about uh, listening to your needs because that will influence eventually our uh, product development roadmap in the future. But I think there is a lot of things that can shine in your, um, your facilities tomorrow. So we open, um, see it as a call to action. What am I doing today? Is it really the most efficient way? Am I producing certain parts in my environment in the right way? Or is additive maybe the better alternative? So you're also welcome to approach me with any questions you may have. But the last thing I wanted to mention is that we also need to look at this as a, um, a, an area of responsibility. So within Edison Manufacturing, we have been the first company to release a sustainability report um, where we, uh, on the one hand, compare what is the CO2 footprint of uh, a specific part if you compare traditional milling or injection molding versus Edison. So that we can use this data in order to justify that this investment is also uh, creating a positive impact on the uh, CO2 footprint of your companies. And aerospace is always a good example of how much kerosene you can save with a kilogram of weight reduction. That's quite uh, significant. So one kilogram, one pound, is saving 40,000 40, gallons per year, which is quite significant. So if you think about the impact on CO2, and that's only one example. If you about trucks and ships and, and, and whatever it is um, driving uh, across the globe in order to deliver spare parts to inventories or inventories and if a fraction of that is being translated into on-demand production where needed and when needed it also has a significant um, impact on CO2 emission and that's what we call mindful manufacturing. So we try to combine all of these streams. First of all, make sure that we have the technologies that you need have the materials that you need, and if you don't have them, uh, how can we develop them either ourselves or together with material partners, or allow you to experiment on your own, because maybe you have access to companies that are developing a specific material for you and you want to test it, and we need to uh, underline that with our software offering, and it's all about the use cases. So I hope you will enjoy this day. That's it from my end. Um, so I'm here all day uh, in case you want to approach me on the team. I would be looking forward to great conversations with you. Enjoy.